what's up guys swim here and today i wanted to bring you guys my first actual deck guide for artifact i used to do these a lot with gwent uh, with the decks i would build and optimize and i don't want to do one for artifact until i found a deck that was truly special for you guys this deck my version of mono blue, which I brought, I think I brought this exact variant to the final top eight of Seat Story Cup. Um, I brought a slightly different variant uh, closer to Hype's List during the group stages of Seat Story. But uh, this is, in my mind right now, probably the single best deck in Artifact, if played correctly, which is a really big asterisk because this is a hard deck to play and it's not to say that this deck isn't fundamentally counterable there will you know be some decks that are able to achieve a higher than 50 percent win rate against this deck but this is probably the strongest deck in the game right now uh particularly after some of the nerfs came down to the other colors so I'm going to be talking about this list for uh, just a couple minutes here before getting into some games to kind of uh, two games specifically to show you guys how to play it and what kinds of things you should be thinking of. It's going to be a pretty long video, but if you want to learn this list, I would highly recommend kind of watching it in its entirety um, because, again, this is one of the hardest lists to play in the game and you're going to have to think about things uh, quite a bit different. So the first question you have to ask yourselves is why is mono blue good? Isn't mono supposed to be kind of like this weaker way to play the game, right? Why mono? mono and you know why blue uh, so blue is a color that's been kind of underrated for a while it's obviously gotten buffed from these uh, from this patch but honestly even outside of this patch that has kind of nerfed some of the other colors uh, mono blue has kind of been an underrated deck people haven't really been playing or building it quite right uh, for one thing this glyph of confusion which might actually even end up being a two of in this deck is extremely powerful in terms of kind of locking the the game out. Um, Skywrath Mage contributes a lot to this deck, and there's a lot of minor optimization tweaks, like for example, playing Kana on the turn slot of deployments that makes the deck a bit stronger, and the 44 card list as well, which is probably the second question that a lot of you guys are asking. So why is this list running 44 cards? Don't you want to be running the minimum amount of cards in card games, right? So the answer to this question is basically, usually as a rule of thumb, it's good to, you know, floor yourself at 40 card minimum, you know, in every card game, minimum cards just allows you to have a higher density of the good cards you want, right? In Artifact, there's actually this kind of weird exception to this, which is caused mostly by the advent of hero signature cards, right? This is not the only deck in the game that you actually want to exceed 40 cards. Uh, Hoy's aggro list, optimized versions of it, after the Wii Play event, have started running like 42, 43 cards. We saw Sifka run some 41, 42 cards list with his uh, roommate Honey. And basically the idea is when you have these hero signature cards, a lot of these signature cards are kind of most powerful at like the six and seven mana turns. In this deck, we see Eclipse, Mystic Flare, and Thunder God's Wrath all being very late game drops. It can be very beneficial to basically lower your curve uh, of your deck, which you otherwise just don't have the ability to lower because these signatures give you deck building rigidity that you don't have in other card games you want to lower your curve by adding just a few extra cards past 40 and the idea of cunning plan and compel are basically too imperative for this deck to really be cut beyond the three of slot so there's going to be a few different ways to build mono blue but you'll find that all the best mono blue decks right now are running at very least 42 cards um you could see something like a conflagration cut maybe Okay, so what's the general game plan of this list, and why are we only running one color? Well, typically the reason why mono is bad in Artifact is because usually other colors don't really have... A, enough of a cohesive game plan to be established with only a single color. Um, for example, the idea of something like an aggro deck, if you want to run mono red aggro, well, black has black and red both have a lot of good aggro tools that you kind of want to combine into kind of like an aggro or mid-range aggro list, right? Whereas mono blue kind of allows you to have this comprehensive game plan of a control strategy that actually doesn't even run any bad cards, right? Usually with a mono deck, you know, there's only enough good cards in each color such that you feel like you hit like 30 or 35 cards and you're struggling to find the last five or 10 cards of your list that you even want to run, 
right? Mono Blue doesn't really have that problem because there's a ton of really great cards in this color, um, and it's just the heroes that are weaker. Now, isn't that a problem running five weak heroes? Well, in Blue, you have a lot of cards that are super situational, right? You have cards that are very dependent on specific board states, like, you know, Annihilation, uh, Mystic Flare, Thunder God's Wrath, Eclipse. You want to be using these when the board really favors it, so it's very timing dependent, and with that, you really need the flexibility of these five blue heroes that can't get kind of shut out of any particular option. In addition to that, you have these squishy heroes that are otherwise kind of punishable unless you're running a lot of them, because if you're running just like two or three blue heroes, then your opponent can deny yourself, uh, deny you the ability to play these powerful spells by basically just killing them and locking them out. And the mono blue version of running a blue control is much safer against these options. So next we can talk about deployments. Uh, it's very important to flop both Ogre, Magi, and Zeus. Uh, we have the Kana coming out on the turn because you want to be able to put her in a lane you, uh, you know, basically want to choose. Some people do flop Kana, but she's not as relevant to come out on the flop. You want to be hitting the passives of Ogre and Zeus with your initial cunning plans, compels, even diabolic revelations, etc. Um, and you want to be able to control which lane your Kana goes in. Lastly, we've got the Skywrath Mage, a fairly recent addition to Mono Blue that me, Hyped, and Sengflas all kind of worked together on. Skywrath in particular was Hyped's idea, um, and it worked really well for us in the tournament. Um, of course, all three of us brought slightly version, slightly different versions of Mono Blue to this tournament because while we all kind of worked together on the list in preparation and practice, you know, we, we still had a couple minor differentiating ideas about how the list should ultimately work, but we all brought Skywrath on the river slot, and he really helps in the mirror as well. The ability to just punch through things with Mystic Flare, using this to stabilize on mana six is just really, really important. So the game plan of the deck is very straightforward. You want to be kind of surviving and stalling in the early turns of the game, you know, with your cantrips, your cycle cards, cunning plan, and compel, slow the game down with stuff like Ignite, maybe use Dimensional Portal, more defense offensively than offensively in a lot of situations. These melee creeps can just be used to chump block three units and just stall out the game. In some matchups, you can develop some very early aggression, like, you know, you can find a time to Dimensional Portal or Prey on the Week where you can really start putting a ton of pressure onto the opponent, but usually you're playing the defensive game, uh, and you're just stalling until you can get to the Annihilation turns. You stall even harder when you hit there with kind of Mystic Flare and Eclipse. Depending on the matchup, sometimes you'll be using Annihilation early and Eclipse late. Sometimes it'll be kind of vice versa. If there's time of triumph on the board, you're going to need to save your Annihilations a little bit later. Um, and otherwise, you kind of want to be saving your Eclipses later because these ramp up over time. Every turn, your Luna stays alive. Um, and you want to be dropping your Aghanim Sanctum typically on the left lane, which you're often controlling, usually by deploying Kana there, so that when you can hit these, like, you know, huge turns uh, on, you know, initiative on the left lane, you can do something like a double Thunder God's Wrath, or maybe like an Eclipse into a Refresh into a Thunder God's Wrath, or, you know, some kind of board wipe into tapping Sanctum and then using Arcane Assault to steal back initiatives so you can just board wipe the next lane. When this deck hits the mana turns like 6, 7, 8, 9, you're basically going to be wiping wiping the board and controlling initiative over and over and over again and kind of completely locking the opponent out of playable options, right? You shut the opponent down completely because these Sanctums allow you to basically blow up a board um, and then play for initiative at the same exact time with the Arcane Assault, which is really, really powerful. The Glyph of Confusion uh, really lends itself towards that win condition even better because once you control the board, think of Glyph of Confusion as sort of like it gives you initiative every single turn as long as you have a hero on that lane and your opponent doesn't. So, you know, on mana six or seven, you'll be blowing up left lane with your Eclipse or your Mystic Flare or whatever, uh, Thunder God's Wrath. Then you slap a Glyph of Confusion down there. And then when your opponent tries to play into that lane, they, their hero gets stunned. So, you know, they basically will lose initiative and every single time they try to play into that lane, they then lose initiative yet again. So it's kind of like it generates a new initiative every single turn, which is incredibly powerful. I'm thinking about running this card as a two of in this list, um, but it will have to do a little bit more testing. And then, of course, you've got your finisher with the Bolt of Democles if you need it. Um, you don't always need this card, but in a lot of matchups, you know, you are surviving to mana turn 10, and you can just kind of punch through the opponent. Now you have a ton of cycle tools with this deck, so you're going to be able to kind of stall and cycle and find your Bolt of Demonkles. 
I don't think I'm saying that right. Uh, and basically just force the game out with it. You'll usually, by this point of the game, have taken, you know, a tower or um, kind of force the other tower to like 20 health. And this can usually just kind of blow the game up. Now, a few really important tips when playing this deck. Uh, you really want to be focusing on, you know, playing defensively and trying to plan ahead for initiative. One of the most important things, you know, you want to keep your Luna alive for Eclipse charges, but you really want to be capitalizing on Ogre Magi. Uh, think about this card as just kind of free value. Whenever you have the opportunity to play spells on its lane, you probably want to go out of your way to do it. Just for that sweet, sweet 25% multicast chance, it's very, very insane um, when you can get these off. Even if, you know, you don't really want to play for 25% chances in a lot of cases because it's kind of greedy, but in this list, the ability to just, like, get free value even out of one-fourth odds is really, really powerful. The last and most important thing I'm going to mention about this deck before we jump into a couple of games here, uh, and this is really, really important because normal decks don't really play like this, is you kind of want to tactically feed your heroes, sort of. Now, in normal card games, the idea of having your own units die sometimes on purpose or sometimes just not going out of your way to save them seems very, very bizarre. But because heroes respawn and because usually feeding your opponent the gold doesn't really make that much of a difference, you kind of want the flexibility of your heroes just kind of dying on sort of a trickle, right? Um, and if you were watching some of the games, you know, at, for example, the Seat Story Cup and uh, seeing some of the commentating, you know, this is something that you might already be aware of. But basically, the lose condition of this deck is having your heroes kind of die all at once. And to prevent this, you kind of want to keep a hero in Fountain at all times. The ideal with this deck is to have one hero die every turn, um starting at turn two. Having a hero die on turn two is actually kind of important with this deck because when they die on turn two or mana four of the game, they'll come back right in time for the mana six, which is really, really important because that's when you're stabilizing the board, usually with Annihilation, but sometimes even with Mystic Flare or Eclipse if the board state kind of prevents itself or presents itself in the right way. So just keep this in mind. Sometimes trying too hard to save your heroes will actually very, very much work against you in this deck. Hopefully the games I'll be playing right now will be able to kind of showcase this idea. Okay, so we're going to be getting into a couple games here. We're going to start off uh, against Petrify's Red Blacklist from the uh, tournament in question, the Sea Story Cup. Uh, obviously, this is the tournament that, or sorry, this is the deck that ultimately knocked me out of the tournament in a 1-2 to two in the series, um, and it lost to Hyped in the finals. So this is a deck that a lot of people are saying is somewhat of a counter to Mono Blue. Um, I think it's pretty close to a 50-50, honestly. So I think this is a good deck to kind of load up and, you know, Know, try to uh, show you guys exactly how to play the matchup because this is you know right now kind of uh, considered the weaker matchup uh, for this deck so pretty awkward flop right off the bat that's going to determine a lot of how this matchup goes you often want to be saving cunning plan for the ogre lane especially with a hand like this we have a pretty weak hand too prayer in the week is nice for early aggression we want to be thinking about where we're going to set that up but our can assaults and thunder god's wrath basically just do nothing in these early turns of the game so we're just going to go ahead and move the luna over to try to effectively dodge this bristle back um you have to decide, you know, which hero you want to save. And when in doubt, Luna is kind of the most important hero to save. Uh, you really should be thinking of all of your other heroes as sort of a resource to leverage. If one of your other heroes dies, think of it just like it's, you know, a ghetto TP, right? Like your hero is able to have the safety of being in the fountain, the mobility of coming back in two turns. Um, the other five, the other four heroes are very expendable, whereas Luna does actually kind of want to stay alive as much as possible. So rough start so far, you know, um, we need to basically defend, 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 because this deck is very aggressive, and we got to be watching out for uh, Chain Frost as an option as well, right? We've already lost one hero, which I think is okay, um, and this is part of the reason, again, that it's very, very important to run these 44 cards, because if we didn't have this uh, cunning plan in our hand, you know, from running it as a 3 of and extending past the 40 card limit, uh, we end up with a much weaker start there, so... Uh, let's take a look at this deployment as 
with all deployments, you should first ask yourself where the opponent's hero is likely to go. Now, I see this extremely likely going into the left lane. He wants to contest the Luna, and left is just kind of the strongest lane to play for. So here, now we're forced to decide where we want to play, right? Arcana could go mid, for example. Um, we want to enable Prey on the Weak as an option, maybe in two turns from now. And kind of going mid with something like a Dimensional Portal can actually lend us to a really, really powerful Prey. Uh, in two turns. I could actually see doing that. Um, and when in doubt, spread your heroes out. Now, kind of going left is kind of what you want to do in a lot of situations. But right now, this Bristleback is being trump blocked by this creep already. Um, you really want to use your hero's health to just kind of keep your tower healthy. In normal card games, Artifact is backwards from normal card games. It, um, in normal card games, your tower health or your, you know, your hero health or whatever is basically a resource for you to leverage for value, right? You kind of want to abuse your own health so that you can build this board presence and then win the game with board presence, right? In Artifact, it's actually almost the opposite. Um, and now here we have to decide how we're going to kind of map out this turn. It's kind of interesting. So we want to deep portal mid. We want to save Prey on the Weak for next turn on mid lane because there's going to be a lot of damage things here once we deep portal. And we want to Foresight from either left or right. Now, we could hold the Foresight to multicast with the Ogre, but I'd rather use it here. If we find something like another Foresight, uh, it'll be really good on the right side as well. There's not really a reason to hold it in this case, right? So just keep this in mind. In Artifact, your heroes are kind of the resource you want to burn through and leverage um, because your hero health will just always come back. And that's okay. It's not really ideal that this Luna's dying here, but of course there's nothing we can do about it with our given hand. You know, he was uh, fairly lucky he didn't have a creep spawn here because otherwise his Lich doesn't always go in front of the Luna. But it's not the biggest deal because as mentioned, while Luna is important to keep alive, it's still good in general to kind of have your heroes having a trickle death, right? So far, none of our other heroes on this uh, on this round are dying. And we always want, we want a hero to die every turn, unless it's Luna, of course, but we don't mind as much. We want a hero to die every turn to just kind of slow down the pace of the game. So off of this foresight, we do at any cost, which means now we have a potential secondary option. We have to think about whether we want to use Dimensional Portal here into Prey on the Week next turn, or at any cost. Now, there's a very powerful at any cost situation here on the left lane. We've got Zeus deploying, which means if we put it here at any cost, his passive will kill the Bristleback. We want to play for initiative on the left side. Um, let's just go ahead and use Dimensional Portal here. Now, uh, our opponent might pump his Mercenary Exiles to kill this creep. This would really hurt our, well, it would marginally hurt our Prey on the Week, but that's okay. Um, and just plan around Prey on the Week. When you have it in your hand, this card is so powerful, it will kind of warp a little bit the way you're able to play. Um, and it's because Prey on the Week is so powerful when you enable it and go out of your way to enable it that I'm personally confident this list only needs one bolt of Demolkles. Because this prey is basically going to... Th this tower is already going to be dead in a few turns, right? This prey will summon too many dogs, in this case, uh, six already. And the opponent's tower won't really have a way to respond. So now that we're setting up for this out on a cost, we can go ahead and pass here. Um, if the opponent steals initiative with something like a hip fire, we'll steal it back with Arcane Assault. But I think it's a little too early to cycle the Arcane Assault in this case. We could go for it. I mean, we don't necessarily need to. We've got the Glyph of Confusion. We have the opportunity to multicast it with the Ogre. And now that the hip fire isn't an issue, there is a consideration to just cycle this Arcane Assault. It's a bit of a tricky one, actually. It's risky to give up the idea for initiative, but we do have the Glyph. I think in this case, the safe move is to just keep it in hand. It's very tempting to try to go for a multicast to giving you free value, but the safer play is to just keep your initiative tools here. And when in doubt, you should just do that. Like, these are basically just get-out-of-jail-free cards. And you'll see when this list basically starts to control the game and start to really, really take over the pace of the game, that these Arcane Assaults in hand are your tool to just literally completely shut the opponent out. So we're just going to go wide here. Uh, when in doubt, develop all three lanes. The Zeus is going to go left to add any cost and just completely stabilize left. We're going to pray mid for huge value off of our dogs. And our Skyrath will just kind of go right, hopefully not directly into the Phantom Assassin, but we've got pretty low odds of that. Um, maybe we'll draw some that'll help this guy with just do a little bit more anyway. 
So very happy about the situation we're in. Now keep in mind, at any cost, um, we'll slide units together that die before the static field triggers. So even if Zeus had spawned, say, over here on the left side, it would still be able to kill the Bristleback, guaranteed. Normally we want to develop a Sanctum before doing it, but it's too important to lock the opponent out of options here, so we're just going to blow it. And this is very, very, very powerful stabilization of this line. So, let's evaluate our new tools. We've got Prey on the week here. Um, as mentioned before, we have the opportunity to summon six dogs. And let's, uh, now that, you know, we, we have this, uh, we have this situation where the opponent has kind of playable options, it's always a good idea to think about what they will probably play. I expect as soon as I play a card, He'll probably play either a Viscous Nasal Goo or a Stone Hall Elite. Much more likely a Stone Hall Elite. Uh, in this case, it doesn't really matter as much. It's not really going to be affecting how we're playing here. Uh, let's just go ahead and get our prey on. Did I say it was likely to be a Goo? Or did I say Stone Hall Elite? I'm... If I said still not late, I meant goo. Okay, interesting. So he's got another mercenary exiles to develop. Um, and we can just start chipping away this tower. As we can see, this tower is basically just going to be dying in a few turns, right? And there's very little he can do about that. These dogs will uh, just be chipping eight to his tower each turn. So we have initiative here. And with this deck, it's always incredibly important to, you know, consider, you know, am I happy giving up initiative? Uh, right now, because we own left, we've got these arcane assaults we can use for free. And he's got no heroes coming in. There's no downside to giving up initiative right now. Let's go ahead and develop our Sanctum on the left lane. When you have Sanctum, you normally, you know, the ideal is to develop Sanctum in left, from left, refresh it, use your mana there, um, and then just keep it around. But left lane is going to be the most important to put the Sanctum in. So even if we wanted to play a spell here, we would really just have to Sanctum left because you got to be thinking ahead with your Sanctums, and that's just where you're going to want it. So here we're going to go ahead and just buy health items. Jasper Daggers in this particular matchup doesn't really do anything. We can peel off the Viscous Nasal Goo, which is kind of neat, but unfortunately our blue heroes are typically a little too squishy for that to make a difference. But we're still going to go ahead and take it there, and then we'll just take the Flask. Items in this deck are basically built to try to keep your heroes alive. We really would have liked to see a Stonehall Cloak that early, but I think this is okay. Okay, so we're going to try to plan out a little bit how we're going to be thinking about using our spells. In general, both of these heroes actually kind of want to be on the left lane, if possible. Um, we want to be able to keep stuff alive. Luna going left helps with your eclipses in the future. Um, we can start with that there, and then I think it's fine to um, put Ogre mid. This is actually a tricky deployment. It's going to depend a little bit on a top decks. If we draw Annihilation, we really don't want to play anything into the right lane. And we've got a few draws here, actually, because we've got the infinite mana off of the Sanctum. We're going to be able to cycle some of our cards, like Compels, and try to find into the Annihilation. Okay, we're pretty happy to see the Slaughter God's Wrath here. Um, this will allow us to double play it at the start of the next turn. And we actually kind of have our combo already, right? So one thing we can do is we can Glyph here on the left lane. And then we can double Thunder God's next turn from left and basically kill all of his heroes. This one will be unlocked, which is incredibly powerful, right? Uh, so there's nothing for us to spend our mana on here. We might want to steal initiative back mid, and we have to start thinking about, you know, what we could use mid off of initiative. We could Mystic Flare, blow up these two units before he has the opportunity to do something uh, like Berserker's Call. Right now, Berserker's Call doesn't kill both of our heroes, so initiative isn't super important. Um, let's go ahead and develop the... Glyph first. This is probably the safe play. If we want initiative, either way, we're going to be using Arcane Assault to play for it, right? So now we can sync them. And as always, it's really important to kind of think, you know, what are you playing around in any given situation? We only have one health item here, which means Zeus is a little bit vulnerable. But at one health, nothing the opponent can do can really kill it except for pick off, which is a one of. So I think we're safe just leaving our Zeus at a lower health threshold here. So the question is, do we want initiative in the mid lane? Um, and the answer is, I don't really see a way he can punish us for not having initiative, right? Um, there's nothing that could really happen here. Now that Axe is nerfed down to six, he can't just blow up our Ogre. Um, and we're probably going to just flare these two units without initiative. So in this case, I think I'm pretty happy just cycling Compel as a card because we don't really have the mana to do anything with it in the other lanes. So we'll just use Compel in place just to cycle it. Um, try to get our card draw out before the uh, Bolt comes online. Okay. 
uh, we're pretty happy with the situation, I think. We could Jasper the Zeus uh, just to deal a little bit more damage, or we could potentially try to save it for, uh, like, a Nasal Goo. I actually think there's a decent chance he might go for a Nasal Goo mid this turn. I think I'll go ahead and hold off, unless he wants to use Berserker's Call. Um, the odds of him having one in his hand that he's just kind of been saving because it's not a super high tempo play are pretty high. Okay, there's the Maul. Uh, not too much of a surprise that this is coming out. And... We can just start fighting for this lane a little bit. Now, the one the one regret is, you know, we don't have... In this case, we don't have any sort of annihilation. So we might just have to take the flare on the right side instead of taking it on the left side. Um, this is a hard choice. Usually, you are working with slightly better tools at this point. I think we can probably safely open with a Fountain Flask on Kana. Because there's a fairly good chance our Skyrath is dying, particularly if we don't have initiative. In which case, we kind of meet our requirements of having a hero die this round. Again, we have right now no heroes in Fountain. And this is actually, if it's hard to kind of wrap your head around like thinking about it like this. But this is something we're actually concerned about. We don't really want all five of our heroes to be alive. Because it means if he kills them all at once, we're very vulnerable, right? So he's passing for initiative. We can steal it back with Arcane Assaults. I think I really favored doing this here. Um, presumably he wants to coup the Skyrath and kind of lock us out right lane. Uh, and we clone the Assaults, so we're very happy about doing that. Again, always always think about where your Ogre is, because, I mean, that 25% chance is so huge. Being able to draw that extra card is very, very OP, and you just want to abuse it as much as you humanly can. Okay, so we're reasonably okay with this. Doesn't really affect anything. It would have been nice if we had Annihilation in our hand, we might have been able to flare this lane and then Annihilate here. Uh, but because we don't, we kind of have no choice but to just try to fight for this. So we can just open with Flare here. Uh, the nice thing is we don't really need the initiative in this case. Um, just because we have the Glyph of Confusion developed on the left lane, which means we kind of have the guaranteed initiative coming through here, right? So we don't need to worry about, you know, maybe saving the initiative tool. And here, we've really hurt the value of his coup, right? The PA kind of wants the coup to lock us out of actions, but because we've played our action already, this coup kind of does basically nothing. In fact, if anything, it might even help us because it commits a fairly valuable resource to doing honestly kind of nothing. Our hero just comes back with mobility. And we're really set up for this double Thunder God's Wrath. As we can see, this will kind of immediately kill the Phantom Assassin. It'll really, really hurt the Lich coming down. If the Lich comes down left, uh, it'll just die to the Zeus. Um, gives us a lot of options. Kills the uh, Legion Commander, which has the Hourglass equipped, uh, or sorry, <laughs> equipped. You really want to be kind of targeting that Hourglass as you go. So right now we have to think about, you know, whether we might want to use Revtil Signet Ring on this Skyrath Mage, because we don't have initiative in this case anyway. Right now, the concern is basically pick off, or maybe the Lich using a gank on the Skyrath Mage on the right side. But because the PA is kind of uh, already dead, I think we're probably safe holding onto the Signet Ring for now. So the big question at this point is whether we can kind of defend this lane. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take the Blink Dagger from the middle, because we don't want to be seeing this again. Taking it from the left would keep one in our item deck. And we'll have to see what he does here. Again, he has initiative, but he basically doesn't, because a Glyph of Confusion will stun anything he puts into this left lane, which means, you know, if he plays these outside of left lane, we can steal initiative back with a Can Assault. So we've got the Sanctum, which is, you know, everything we've ever wanted here. Um, and we have the ability to do something like Double Thunder God. So we can just actually pop this Bristleback right away. This Bristleback is basically dead already if we want that. Um, we can even do something like Blink the Luna over uh, and try to play for a high roll condition of Lucent Beam onto the Lich in the middle lane. Now, that's a very risky high roll. Of course, right now, the Lich would go down to one health off of the Double Thunder Gods, um, which means, you know, the Luna blinking would basically just kill it on the spot, which would be really, really huge. If we had a second Sanctum developed here, we'd be able to really, really go off in this case. Wouldn't even be fair. Uh, honestly, we're just going to take, I think, the Double Thunder Gods. We might be able to do something like Blinking Over with Luna. Makes us a little bit vulnerable to Chain Frost, but I think I am okay with this. And as, as you can see, this is just really powerful. I mean, the Bristleback is going down to one already. We can kill it with the Jasper Daggers if we want at this point. Um, and the Legion with the Hourglass is dead. The PA is dead on the right side, locking him out of actions right. Uh, and we're just recontrolling the board. We're even managing to defend right at 8. And when you're able to defend um, these 
lanes that have like low HP, you can really force the opponent to overcommit resources they really otherwise don't want to into fighting for them. So now the Zeus is just dead to combat and it doesn't even get to attack, uh, which is really, really huge. So we have to ask ourselves, how safe is blinking the Luna over? If it snipes this Lich, that's ridiculous value. Uh, we have to assume he's about to use Chain Frost on us, which is pretty nasty. We don't really want our Luna spawning into the Chain Frost. Um, it will blink over to the left side, and if the Chain Frost just hits the Luna, then his guy is growing for free, and we're losing all three of our heroes, which is really, really bad. Um, at the same time, we have the ability to maybe play for... Uh, play for the Lucent Beam hitting one of these other heroes as well. It's a very, very nasty Chain Frost if it hits us. If we had developed the conflagration earlier, if this hasn't been if this hadn't been locked by the hourglass, this lich would just already be dead and it wouldn't be an issue. It's a very high rolly one and six. Um, but even if it is this other mercenary exiles, it's pretty fun. I think now that we've equipped the signet ring on her, she's at ten. It's probably too hard for the lich to kill her. Um, we're worried about basically just giving the stone hall free food, right? Like if we didn't have this Revtil signet ring in hand right now, we blink the Luna over, it goes in front of the stone hall, guaranteed, right? And then he starts the chain frost. She has six. He starts the chain frost on Luna. It will almost assuredly bounce back to her, killing her at some point. And maybe all three of our blue heroes just die. The stone hall elite just grows for free. And we just fed our six health Luna to two taps of eclipse. Feels very bad because we have the signet ring. It forces the eclipse to find four taps on her instead of two, which is a really huge deal. Um, and we just picked off one of his units for free. Now, whenever you can blink Luna rightward, you're actually gaining a bit of a bonus on eclipse. Uh, you can think of it sort of like every time you blink Luna to the next lane forward. Yeah, pretty nasty Berserker's Call. Every time you blink Luna to the next lane forward, you're sort of getting two-thirds of an Eclipse charge, if that makes sense. You're getting like two extra damage on your Eclipse because assuming you use it on, let's say, a random lane, on average, you might get one more Eclipse charge now that you've uh, forced the Lucent Beam out here. Um, we could consider annihilating this, but honestly... I just don't really see too much of a reason to. And we have the initiative steal back potential as well here. So it looks safe just developing conflagration here. This is something I'm pretty happy to do. As you can see, this is a deck that requires a lot of thinking. I set this on standard timer instead of tournament timer because I have to explain my plays and that takes longer. Okay. Uh, don't do that. It's a misplay. We all get one. Okay, so the Lich is coming back, but it won't be able to necessarily come back uh, into a lane where it doesn't get stunned, right? Because we still have that Glyph of Confusion on the left lane, which is basically just winning us the game, right? And because of that, there's no reason to use Arcane Assault here, right? Because we have the guaranteed initiative on the left side that he can do nothing about. So we just want to save our Arcane Assaults. If we want to use them, we want to use them from the left side, right? Uh, so, uh, we can take a second Blink Dagger here. Honestly, it's not going to do that much for us, but saving our gold will probably do even less. No Maul utility means taking the Fountain Flask is pretty good here. And we're still just mostly worried about Chain Frost. Chain Frost is kind of the spookiest thing. I expect his Lich to redeploy mid again, actually. Oh, interesting. Okay, okay. He wants to punch through this tower. If he had Chain Frost, I think he would go mid. Maybe this is a Telegraph he doesn't have Chain Frost, or he just knows that he won't have initiative to use it. Okay, so we have to really evaluate our tools, and let's look at our Eclipse charge. Our Eclipse is about to go to seven charges off of the Lucent Beam. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Means it kills everything, no matter where the Lucent Beam goes. Now, that's an extremely valuable Eclipse, which means we're definitely going to want initiative for this mid lane. The only regret is we can't curve this with Prana Week. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six dogs is also incredibly powerful. I think this Eclipse is a little too good. But, of course, we're at the point of the game where we're just going to be looking to steal initiative back. Um, so we can just go ahead and open with Foresight. We've got 16 mana to spend here, and, of course, we are going to be spending it. Diabolic Revelation is a little too costly at this point in time. The only downside of Eclipse is we lose initiative for this side with Mystic Flare. And we actually really want initiative for this side. Maybe we actually won't use initiative on the mid lane. Initiative is kind of a strange thing to min-max. We can start by cloaking our Zeus. I 
I mean, you have to think of initiative as kind of like a zigzag, right? Like, if we play for initiative in mid, use Eclipse, we're out of mana because we don't have a Sanctum mid, and we can't steal back initiative after Eclipsing, which means he gets initiative here. He'll Chain Frost this, and that's really nasty. We don't really want to be able to let him do that because Chain Frost will beat us with initiative and then get him initiative back again. But because we have the Glyph here, it's actually kind of really hard for him to reestablish that initiative. Even if he blinks the Lich away at that point, he's lost initiative, uh, and we'll be able to blow him out. Saving the Eclipse is always going to be valuable, um, and because it's the only one in hand, it actually might be a little bit safer not to take it mid. It's really, really, really tempting to take this Eclipse mid. It's pretty nuts, um, but honestly, playing for initiative on the right side is, I think, likely going to be more important. Um, we'll have to see how he responds, and right now we've got so much initiative off Glyph of Confusion that we can kind of afford to save these tools. So I think... Therefore, what we'll do is we'll take the Arcane Assault here. Um, just, you know, start cycling these. It's good to draw cards before the Legion Commander comes back. There's the other Assault. So now that we have initiative, and we're just chaining, right? We're not really letting him get a play. Um, so, got a nice ping there off the Lucent Beam, and the Eclipse is up to 7. So we could blow up this entire board if we wanted. Um, if the Beam had gone into the Axe, is actually a consideration to flare these two for 6 damage each. But in this case... I think, again, we'll just play for initiative on the right side. I'm identifying the right as just more important. This Eclipse is really tempting, but this Prey on the Weak is also pretty good here. And I really like the ability to just play for initiative uh, on the right side, which we can now do because we haven't used all of our mana, right? If we Eclipse, we lose initiative guaranteed. Uh, and we really want to just flare this Lich and blow him up. We're a lot more scared of black play options right now, more so than red play options. Red play options actually don't really bother us. Okay, he uses Call, which will push a bit of tower damage, um, but we can kind of stabilize this lane later. I mean, Eclipse is only getting stronger as an option, and because we have only one in hand, this kind of inclines us to be a little more conservative with it, right? So now we can just very simply blow this Lich up. Um, you know, when you have the choice between Mystic Flare and Eclipse, I mean, this is obvious in this case, we just want to use the Flare, but Eclipse is, you know, a stronger card that you want to be able to preserve, right? So now our Skyrath is a little low. I don't really want to use Flask on this, although the odds of this getting picked off is starting to get a little bit higher. Um, you know what? I will actually use Flask on this, I think. I don't think there's really a better thing to save it for in this case. Same with Jasper Daggers. Okay, we don't want this many Blink Daggers. This is a little too much. We're not unhappy to see this healing salve, though. Uh, there's not really improvements he's going to be playing that we want to keep up. It's possible tanking this much damage mid was a mistake. I mean, the fact that two of our towers are a little low is uh, maybe unnecessarily spooky. That being said, I mean, we have preserved the Eclipse. Like, we have the ability to just blow him up in entirety. So we're pretty safe regardless. We want to be playing these for lanes that aren't left because we don't want them to get stunned right away. Um, so I think that right is kind of more important to develop the Kana for future value. Ogre will be able to handle mid with just blowing up with Eclipse. We also need to think about, you know, what the Ogre wants to play um, because we want to be able to increase... We want to min-max our multicast, right? Multicasting Eclipse kind of sucks, but it's still... We want to put Kana in the lane that we are putting more value into, basically. If we draw Arcane Assault, that's really powerful because we can Arcane Assault from the left side, steal initiative back, go into mid, Eclipse, steal initiative back again. But we have no draws because the Hourglass is just going to lock us out of play options here. Unlucky. Okay, so obviously we want to take an Arcane Assault. We can't Diabolic Revelation, unfortunately, on this board state because we have too many dogs that we don't really want to sacrifice. We want them to punch tower one more time, and then we can think about using uh, that. So we're just going to go ahead and assault here. Nothing fancy to do. And just chain initiative. That's what this deck does. You just hold on to assault when in doubt, and you just chain initiative over and over and over again uh, until the opponent basically just has no play options. So now we can take the Eclipse and just completely blow him out. There's basically nothing for him to do off this. We have to understand, of course, that we are giving up initiative on the right side in doing so, which is kind of spooky. Um, but I think that it's probably safer to do it here than otherwise. Now, Eclipse is going to be an interesting tool because it's very variable in terms of kind of how good 
it'll often be, right? Like, in some games, you're going to be holding on to your Eclipses very diligently, and some of your Eclipses are going to be three charges, and you're not going to be able to do very much. Part of the skill of playing with this deck is identifying, you know, exactly how important it is to save your Eclipses. There's no way he can really shut a set of play options here, so there's not really a reason to blink the Ogre over. I think in this case, though, since this tower is already dead, I will just go ahead and do it. Um... I would be a little afraid of gank. If he had PA right, he could gank my Zeus and block me out of Glyph. And if so, I would blink my Ogre left. When you blink left into a Glyph of Confusion, uh, you're sort of cheating it because it stuns it for that round, and then next round it gets unstunned, which is very powerful. Um, in this case, I think my Ogre is actually accomplishing very little left. Um... It looks like he's just losing to the Bolt of Damocles here either way. I think the ogre, the ogre left will probably just allow me to just close out the game there. So we can just go ahead and do that. So, uh, it's very important to be aware of your time bank with this deck. Obviously, I'm talking through my plays and it's slowing me down because I'm trying to explain everything. But, I mean, as you can see, he's 10 minutes on top of us. And if you're playing Mono Blue and you're thinking about all your options, this will be very, very common. You will be constantly at a really low amount of... Uh, a really low amount of time left. So he just used Time of Triumph. Um, right now we have the guaranteed lethal on the left side with the Bolt of Damocles that we're going to use, plus our combined attacks. Presumably at this point, he'll equip a Blink Dagger to try to uh, get a unit unstunned into the left lane. He wants to equip a Blink Dagger, Blink left so that it stuns itself on Glyph, and then next turn he can kind of, you know, be able to play off of that. Um, potentially block us out. So as soon as he plays the Blink, we're just gonna go ahead and blow this up. Again, we don't need an initiative for the left lane because we've got the Glyph of Confusion there. It is generating free initiative every turn. And you can see here why Glyph of Confusion is just so strong with this deck. Uh, nothing really useful. And here we can just blow him out. So as you can see, we've gone through a pretty hefty majority of our deck at this point. Uh, we've gone through a good... Uh, I guess this is safer. We've gone through basically what uh two-thirds of our deck so you have like pretty extreme reliability on finding something like bolts not necessarily if not on turn 10 then uh, very soon um obviously we don't need the multicast here but it's very funny when we get it because there are some situations where you can get a double bolts by multicasting with ogre if you're a good player and we have the sanctum to just be able to bolt again of guy of course we just don't need it here so we're just going to close the game out so this uh, it's a pretty straightforward game. I think that there might have been a bit... Obviously, the conflagration play was a brain fart. Don't do that. Um, there might have been a bit of a misplay on holding onto that Eclipse one more turn. It's possible that was a little risky, getting both my towers down to eight. That Berserker's call from him did a lot of damage that I could have prevented. Maybe using Eclipse uh, the turn earlier would have been a little bit better. But overall, a pretty clean game. A pretty good showing of kind of how this deck is meant to be played. This is going to be your average game. Play for Prey on the Week early, you know, set up that value. Really think about Prey on the Week. It's not a card you can just throw out. You have to think about it, enable it, don't use it too early. Don't just curve it out, right? We did that. We got a ton of pressure on the mid tower. You want to play defensively, set up your add any costs. We did that left, and that early add any cost left, at that point, as soon as I did that, I was feeling very confident about my, you know, win in the game. Like, the game was not won at that point, but it's very hard for him to come back from that sort of value swing on, like, turn three of the game. Um, just let your heroes die a trickling death so that you're kind of playing a little bit safer in that way. And then just kind of finish with Initiative Abuse, Glyph of Confusion, and Bolt of Damocles. So, uh, let's go ahead and play one more. I'm going to go ahead and have my opponent here switch it over to a mono blue mirror. Mm -hmm. 